good afternoon, and thank you very much for the very kind invitation being here to present this, this lecture about single molecule research, physics, and biology. And actually, the title, the original title, was probably about information and energy, but that's the things that we can measure in these experiments. So what I will try to do today is overview a bit the field uh, having in mind that most of you may have not seen um, this sort of presentation before, from the basics and to some of the applications in actually measuring quantitatively energy and information in, uh, in molecular transformations. Okay? So just uh, as a sort of very short introduction, let me tell you that what we do in the lab <clears throat> and what we can measure um, uh, relies on this sort of a spectroscopy measurement, which are called force spectroscopy. So the key idea is that we are able to apply tiny forces and molecules, and by doing that, by tracking, by monitoring the evolution, the time evolution of a molecule, measuring the force acting on that molecule, we can extract at the same time energy, but also we can extract information. Information is a physical quantity that is measurable, and also we have a very good access to that quantity with this sort of experiments. Now, if I have to tell you about force spectroscopy, of course, I should start lining the different experimental techniques. But I won't, this, I won't do so. I will just mention the one we are doing in my lab in Barcelona, which is called optical tweezers. So it's just using the light can exert very tiny forces on materials okay, that are immersed in water. And in the case, you will see the forces we are applying are those we're applying on small micron-sized bits. <clears throat> Our micron-sized bits are captured in optical traps, and by capturing them in the focus of a laser, that, uh, that's an optical trap, we can measure very small forces, and we can also apply very small forces. So by applying these very small forces, which fall in the range of the piconewton, we can actually uh, manipulate individual molecules, and we can actually make them transform from one state to another. So we can, for example, make a protein to unfold, to go from the native folded state to the, native, um, to, the, to the unfolded state, okay? Because we apply those very small forces. And of course, for measuring that, for doing that, these forces have to be very small. Because as you know, the energies of folding are on the order of kcal per mole. So kcal, kcal per mole is around kBT, which means 10 to the minus 21 joules. So if we want to measure this sort of energy amount differences in a transformation, we have to apply forces and we have to measure extensions that combine, multiply one by each other, give you this amount of energy, 10 to the minus 21. And you see the force we apply is piconewtons, which is 10 to the minus 12 newtons. Then measure the distances we measure are nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters. And if you multiply one piconewton, one nanometer, you get 10 to the minus, minus 21 newtons per meter, which is 10 to the minus 21 joules, which is 1 kBT. So that's the idea why we can access with so much accuracy these transformation processes between different conformational states in the molecules, because we have access to very small forces, because Newton-like, and we have access to very small distances, which are nanometer range-like. OK, that's the key idea. The, for those of you who have never seen what is a single molecule manipulation experiment, I'd like to show you this pooling DNA, which uh, I summarize in this sentence at the end, uh, in, in, in the bottom of the slide, which is take a single DNA molecule and actually pull from its ends while recording the force extension curve. So that's the experiment, to pull from its ends a molecule. And the physical information we get about this biological molecule is a so-called force extension or force deformation curve. So here you see a pictorial representation of the experiment. There is um, one bit in the optical trap, a pointer. I didn't ask for a pointer. Maybe um, someone could give one. OK, so, so here you see there are two bits. One bit is in the tip of a pipette. That's the optical tweezer setup. That's a fluidic chamber. And we have here a bit inside the fluidic chamber which is immobilizing the tip of a pipette, and another bit in an optical trap. You don't see here, but there is a lot of light here, concentrated, focused. So here, this is infrared light, probably it's 30 millivolts of power, 
or even more, which are used to trap, optically trap the beat. Okay, that's just because the light carries linear momentum, and by carrying linear momentum and changing from one medium water to another medium of higher index of refraction, it produces a net force due to the change to the change in the direction of light, so the change in the linear momentum of light. That force is used to capture this beat. That's our dynamometer. That's what we use to measure the force. And this is the molecular construct. We take a DNA molecule, and then um, this DNA molecule has two strands that are represented here, but two different colors. It's like a ladder, and there it's labeled at the ends, uh, at the two ends, by, by, by biotin and, an, and, and a digoxygen, which is an antigen. And these beads are coated with the complementary, uh, with the complementary molecules that specifically recognize these labeled ends. So this is labeled with streptavidin that specifically binds to biotin, and this is coated with this bottom bead is coated with antibody, which specifically recognizes antigen. So that's a typical setup for doing the manipulation. So you mix the beads, one bead, beads of one type, you mix them with with DNA and the other beads are not coated with DNA, but then somehow you mix one type of the beads with the DNA, and then you flow the two types of beads, one coated with the DNA, the other uncoated with the DNA in the fluidic chamber, and you do the experiment. So here is a video, uh, and an, a, a video that shows you the experiment. Um, so here you see, first we're going to look for a beat, uh, for a beat that will go to the end of a pipette, so we move the motors of our fluidic chamber to capture, to trap one bit. This is a 2.8 microns bit, is a, is a, a 2 microns bit. It's a small bit, okay, in comparison to the other one you will see next. And then it's brought by moving with motors the, the chamber to the tip of a pipette and by air suction is immobilized. And now we go, to, we go to, to look for another bit that has been previously incubated with DNA. So it has DNA protruding protruding molecules from the surface. What you will see is half lambda DNA, which is a molecule of 24,000 base pairs, eight microns, control length. Now this is a size a bigger bit to discriminate from the other one. And now you'll see this bit has DNA molecules protruding from the surface. Of course, you cannot see them because it's infrared light. You cannot see the DNA molecules, they are too small. But then the idea is that if these molecules are like protruding from the surface, are forming random coils, they, they would be like uh, collapsed on the surface of the bead. So I need to approach this bead, okay, to this another bead, because the molecules are, on the, are, are forming random coils on the surface, to fish the other end of the DNA molecule. And here I have one, okay? So you see that I have one molecule, okay? Now uh, it's a question of adjusting concentrations to avoid having more than one molecule. Of course, you can have two, three of them, depends. But we want to have a single molecule. Now, once you have the tether, you see that there is this action, direct action between the two bits, when otherwise there is just water. So that's what proves that you have a molecule connecting, connecting the two bits. Then you can start your experiment, and then you move the optical trap up and down to record the force as a function of the extension, which is the distance of the two bits, or in the case I will show you, it's just the relative displacement of the optical trap. That's not important. But that's the way we measure, and here is the result of this experiment for this half lambda DNA, okay? <clears throat> and then you see that, that typical, that's a classical experiment that was carried out actually first time in Berkeley in US and also in, in Ecole Normale Supérieure in, 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 in Paris by the group of Francois Caron. Okay, they did this measurement uh, in which they demonstrated that DNA is an extensible molecule because DNA has eight, this DNA has eight microns, but if you see the force, of course, it starts increasing when we approach this eight microns extension, but then something magic happens here. At some point, we overextend the DNA molecule, which was supposed to have just eight microns, eight microns and we reach up to 14 microns, so this is 70% of the initial control length. So what's going on? Okay, we know now that DNA is having a, a structural transformation by which quite probably the double helix is converting into a ladder. So you gain 70% of extension by uncoiling, unwinding the double, the double helix. Okay, that's the reason. And of course, separating the, the base pairs 
between each other. So they are not stacked anymore like in a double helix, but in a ladder they are more spaced and the distance is not basically zero, but something like three Armstrongs. And this accounts for the additional overextension that you observe in the experiments. Now the experiments that I'm more interested, these are beautiful experiments and very useful because they allow you to get information um, about the, the elastic properties of polymers. So you can apply this not only to DNA, you could apply actually in any po polymer in chemistry. Okay, you just need to synthesize to express it and be able to attach it to two bits in this setup you have seen. So you can apply it to, to, to any polymer you, you may want to do. So this is very powerful. You can measure quantities such as the persistent length, okay, which are very difficult to measure in other assays, like for example with electrophoresis, or with, for example, light scattering, which are typical techniques used for measuring these quantities, but in this experiment you have a very precise control of what you are measuring. Okay, and the experiment I want to tell you more is about what I call unzipping, which is not the fact that you probe the elastic behavior of a, of a molecule, but you probe uh, the intramolecular bonds that keep the native conformation or the native structure of a molecule. So before I was mentioning the transformation of a protein that you can unfold by pulling from its ends, that would be a case of unzipping. When you pull a protein from the um, uh, nitrogen and carboxyl termini from the amino and carboxyl termini when you pull the protein what it happens is that you break the intramolecular bonds that hold alpha helices structures, alpha helices, uh, beta sheet structures and so on and then you produce just a single strand, a single stranded polypeptide change, a stretch one, you are breaking internal bonds and therefore you are producing unzipping. Okay, so I schematically represent this by showing the zipper, so you, separate, you break the bonds that are the, the, parallel, the, the interactions that hold these two, let's say, strands together, you break them by pulling down uh, the zipper. Um, so we can do this experiment with DNA if instead of pulling the DNA from the two ends to, to the opposite ends, you pull the DNA from the same end but from the two strands, so two strands from the same extremity. Um, and this is the experiment that is shown here, and uh, I will try to stop this because this uh, starts immediately. I don't want to start immediately the animation. But you see, here we are doing the experiment. We have a double helix, which in this case is a molecule of no, um, approximately the same length as before. It's seven micron instead of eight micron. Instead of, sorry, of, 12, of eight micron, it's uh, seven micron. But the experiment is different because that, that molecule had 24,000 base pairs before. This molecule now has um, 7,000 base pairs, not 24,000. And when you do the experiment, you don't stretch elastically the molecule, you unzip it. Because by pulling the two strands, you break the intermolecular bonds that hold the double helix, and you convert the double-stranded DNA into single-stranded DNA. So it's a totally different experiment, okay? You are here really breaking bonds. Before you were just elastically stretching a polymer, so you were fighting against the entropic forces that make your polymer form a random coil. Here, no, here you really you are modifying the double helix to convert into single strands. And then what you see when uh, we do the experiment is that the force goes up to about 40, 15 piconewtons, and you see this south tooth pattern that extends for the whole length of the herpin until you have completely unzipped it. At the end, this herpin is closed by a loop, so this means that the two single-stranded DNA molecules are not separated, they are ligated by the loop at the end, so it means that you convert the two sides of the, sing the two single-stranded DNA sides, let's say, into a single-stranded DNA polymer. So what you will see here now in the animation is that one base pair, which are 7,000, corresponds to approximately uh, one nanometer, so this is approximately 7,000 nanometers in total extension for unzipping, and you will see when we reach about 7,000, you will see that the force goes up because we have fully unzipped the DNA and we are just left with a single-stranded DNA produced by unraveling the double helix, okay? So here the nice thing is to see what happens when I unravel the structure. And, and let me go on with the animation. So here you see this out of pattern. This is very characteristic of the sequence. And this is very noisy, but on, on top of being very noisy, there is a reproducible pattern, you will see after why, 
Okay? And this depends on the sequence. So there is noise because there are thermal forces. There is Brownian motion, but also there is signal coming from the sequence. Whenever there is GC or ET, you have a different pattern. And now you see I unzipped completely the DNA hairpin, and now I start measuring the elastic response of the single-stranded DNA. That's the response of the single-stranded DNA in as much in the previous slide I showed, it, I showed you the elastic response of the double-stranded DNA. The only thing is that this is a single-stranded polymer. In the other case, it was a double-stranded polymer. Now the blue line is going, uh, the, the, the blue line is, is going backwards. So at some point when we reach 25 piconewtons, we say to the instrument to start approaching the optical trap to the pipette and therefore to release the force and therefore we follow the same path. These are reversible elastic refolding, if you want, or elastic compaction of the single stranded DNA. But now the interesting question is what will happen after I continue relaxing the force? Will the double-stranded DNA form again or not? Because you see, the double-stranded DNA, to, to, to form the double-stranded DNA, the single-stranded DNA has to nucleate a center for hybridization, and this zipper spontaneously has to refold. But of course, there are many regions where complementarity probably can be found. It's not clear that, the, that, the, 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 that let's say, the 14,000 bases will be able to nucleate at the center to form a 7,000 base pair double helix structure. Now, as you will see, what happens is the following. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So uh, the unzipping is starting somewhere around uh, 7,000 nanometers? The unzipping? No, the unzipping is, OK, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a good observation. Then zipping is starting here. So you see this zero. This means when the bit, this bit here is nearly close to this bit. Now, the force is not shown. But you see here, is, this is just to amplify the, the, the plot. The, the, the range of force in piconewtons goes from 10, 20 to 24. Okay? But there is a zero here. The zero would be somewhere here, maybe, where the names are here. You see, it would be the zero. Now, when the bits are very close, the force is zero. Now, there is a process in which you initially start to move the optical trap, and then you just pull on these handles, and therefore there is just elastic response of the handles, and the hairpin doesn't unzip. So I should draw here a red line going up, like a linear straight line, because basically this is a linear spring. Okay? So this would start here, and then at some point when I reach this force, the force is high enough to start opening the double helix. So actually, the zipping starts here, doesn't start here. The zipping starts here and goes until the end. And then here, I have fully converted the double-stranded DNA into single-stranded DNA. And then here, I have the elastic response of the single-stranded DNA. But okay. what is the linear, uh, in the end, you have this linear trace, right? What causes that linear trace when you already unzipped the entire DNA? Plus, can I say it's the yield region? Can, can you repeat the first part of your question? So the Please. first part is, like, uh, what explains this, uh, this linear trace in the end? OK, so when I was answering his question, I was referring to here. OK, there was a question before. I was talking about here that I don't show in the plot, but there is an initial linear, because the optical trap is a linear optical trap, because the initial response is by the handles. You see here, it's written the oxygening label handle. Here, biotin label handle, we need to put some handles as a spacers to our construct. And they don't change conformation. They don't unzip. They do nothing. They just provide enough space to have the experiment, to do the experiment between the two bits. Otherwise, the bits would touch each other. So this initial part is linear, is elastic response of the combined effect of the optical trap and the handle. Now, this last part in the end is not exactly linear. It has a curvature. And this curvature depends on the persistent length of single-stranded DNA and depends on the stretching modulus of single-stranded DNA. So from this curve here, we can get very useful information, actually, about the elastic properties of single-stranded DNA. But this has nothing to do with the initial part which someone was asking me before. Okay, it was somewhere here, I don't remember. <clears throat>
Is there any question about? So now we are, so the unzipping process, the unraveling of the double helix of the 7,000 base pairs goes from here to there. Now, when I relax the force, I see that I reversibly recover the same level of force. And now you start guessing that this will be reversible because you see, I am actually overlapping the same curve as before. So let's continue seeing the receiving, the, the formation of the double helix after receiving. And you see that I follow the same sort. Of course, there are fluctuations, thermal fluctuations, and no, it's not perfectly identical. Even if you look carefully, you would see some slight hysteresis effects. But the double helix is formed perfectly. Okay? So this means that the matter, this, when, I, I'm, when I'm breaking bonds at these forces, things are reversible. And this is quite remarkable. If you take a piece of chalk, piece of chalk, I will come to you now. If, if you take a piece of chalk and you break it, so I will break just one small piece. So, okay? Of course, that's the same experiment I'm doing here. Although I'm breaking a macroscopic number of bonds in parallel, not as easy as here, which looks like sequential. But if you try to reform it, no way, you will never get it. But here we're, get, we're getting it. And that's because the energy, typical energy formation here, it corresponds to the thermal noise, so it can remodel. But here, this is covalent bonds. The energy typical to reform this is at least 1,000 or 1 million. It's many order of magnitude higher than KBT, OK? which we are at room temperature, so this is 10 to the minus 21 joules, whatever. So this is the big difference between this experiment and this experiment. This experiment. And this is where biology lies, where biology stays. Biology stays where everything can be remodeled continuously. And that's what makes us the fact that we can keep on living. So there was a question here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. And indeed, we, we have done this experiment. What happens if you do this pretty fast? What we have seen is that the force somehow, um, uh, the force somehow goes down. So it, it doesn't collapse here. The force still go, goes down. And you see that this line continues like in a, it's a, it's, it's a continuation of this line. So it, the herpin doesn't reform. But at some point, when you approach 0, you see, prop, there is a big rip in the force, and the whole structure spontaneously reforms. Meaning that as you lower the force, okay, you are farther and farther from this equilibrium-like line. But at some point, the, entrop the force of rehabilitation is so high that spontaneously the barrier is overcome by the molecule. But this is a nice experiment. Um, of course, we have done this at room temperature. So your question is very interesting. What happens if I lower the temperature? Because if I lower the temperature, activation energy, the activation energy is much lower. And therefore, I should start seeing very much more interesting effects. So this is something we can do now because we have a temperature control system. But that's a beautiful experiment to do, not only on this, but in other like RNA molecules, which have not full complementarity, but they are full of defects. OK? Any other question? In this experiment, it is 25 nanometers per second, which means um, uh, that this experiment, so you see, uh, this is 7,000 nanometers. So 25 nanometers per second should be like um, 280 seconds. So this was several minutes. I would say four or five minutes. These were experiments we did very, very slowly because we wanted to have reversible curves to extract the free energies of hybridization. But in this case, it's 25 nanometers. So in our instrument, you can go up to 1,000 nanometers. So in the question by, uh, by, by you, uh, if we, I wanted to see this non-equilibrium effect, I should collapse the force, move the optical trap at 1,000 nanometers per second. This they can do with FM. With FM, it's very natural to do this because they have so high stiffness cantilevers that they can reach uh, at least 1,000 higher unloading rate. So they can do that with, with FM. And with FM, they don't see even refolding sometimes. But then they touch the surface. There are other problems with FM. OK? There were more questions, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, excuse me. I forgot that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs>
So this means that, yeah, so this means that the f your question, if I understood correctly, is about why the force is more or less constant. It's like a structural transition, right? The intensive pressure, which is the force, is constant while you have a change in the volume, in the extension. Okay? It's like in, for example, the melting of ice. You, you keep the pressure constant, but then there is a change at constant pressure and temperature. There is a change of the volume when you go from one phase to another. So this is sort of uh, some, somehow similar. But it's the same reason as melting. Actually, what is happening here is that as you unzip the DNA, the, the, base, pairs that, the base pairs that you find as, you, as your unzipping progresses are always held by the same sort of forces. So it's like an, an avalanche of progression process. Okay? If there would be more GCs which are stronger than ATs at the end, so here at the end there would be many more GCs and ATs as compared to here, the force would go up. But the average number of GCs and ATs is the same. It's a random sequence, and therefore it's more or less the same. Okay? It's like the zipper. I mean, it's a Velcro. If you open a Velcro, the force you have to do is always constant. You don't need to do a higher force at the end. Okay? So that's the same like in your trousers. You don't need to do higher force if you go lower. It's the same force everywhere. Okay? More questions or comments? Yeah, there is one question there. The right part of the, uh, this graph, how would it look like if you have a shorter DNA? A shorter DNA herping, you mean? Uh, yes. So if there would be, let's say, we, we have um, done experiments with herpins of different lengths. So this is 7,000 base pairs. As I told you, this is 7 microns. So one base pair is 1 nanometer in the zipping process. So every time you release one base pair, it is 1 nanometer. So if you want to see individual base pairs, you have to go below one nanometer resolution to them because that's the, the, the relevant scale, right? So this is one nanometer, is one base pair. So if I were to have, I don't know, 3,000 base pair, half short molecule, instead of this long, uh, let's say half of it, it would be the same. But then up, up, when reaching 3,500, which is half, then I would see the single stranded DNA going up. So the shorter the molecule is, you would see the same force plateau, but the pattern ending at a distance proportional to the contour length of the DNA and then rising up the elastic response. Does this respond to your question? Yes. Yeah, more questions. So, <laughs> if, I guess technically you have this transition from a single standard to a double standard when you are re-zipping the molecule. And do you need to wait much longer for the re-zipping to happen at the same force in case of uh, when you re reduce the force? Drastically, you mean? No, uh, like when you are yeah. reducing the force, if yeah. you are coming back in blue curve, yeah. you are staying at exactly the same force for re-zipping. Yeah, the yeah. So are you waiting for much longer time for this re-zipping? Oh, in the experiments, you mean? Yes. Well, in the experiments, uh, we try to get as most advantage of our uh, experimental data. So, you know, uh, we are nearly reversible, but we prefer to keep also the refolding curve at the same speed to see that actually we are under reversible conditions. So if we were to pull faster for refolding, we would see stresses for sure. So what we do is we do the same speed, and then we check whether the red and the blue curves are the same. If they are the same, this means that you are reversible. So that's also a check for us to know that this is a reversible um, curve, and therefore we can measure the work along this experiment by integrating the force distance curve. Okay, that, that, that's the key idea. More questions or comments? Okay, so, um, well, I prefer questions because that's thought to be uh, illustrative, and uh, so I will have to sacrifice some of the results of my talk, but that's not important. Um, it's important that you ask me questions. I'm very glad to answer them all. <clears throat> okay, so go ahead whenever you want. Now, you can do other experiments where instead of pulling uh, one long DNA molecule, you pull a short DNA molecule. And this is very interesting. For example, if you want to study 
the thermodynamic stability of RNA molecules. Because RNA molecules are sh made of short herpins. I mean, you will never find a long RNA herpin of 6,000 base pairs. That's not, that's not possible. I mean, RNA includes structurally disordered and therefore has many uh, base pairs that are non-complementary. So the secondary structure of RNA is much more complex than just a stem ending with a loop. It has different motives. So if we want to study shorter molecules like RNAs or fragments of RNAs, it's essential that you can do the same experiment with shorter molecules. So these are experiments on a 20 base pairs in a hairpin. And then what you see, and this answers the question by yeah, you, I think, it will be, now it's 20 base pairs. So 20 base pairs is 20 nanometers. So it should be the equivalent of this curve here, um, but at 20 nanometers. Now, of course, you cannot see it well because 20 nanometers falls below, uh, beyond the resolution of your eye because this is, you see, it's 1,000. So 20 base pairs would be a tiny segment of here. So what do you would see for 20 segments? So you see what I told you before. You see a plateau, which now is not a plateau. It will be a very small rip and then the elastic response. And this is what you see here, OK? So you see this rip and going on. Now, if you put one after another 20 base pairs, 20 base pairs to make 7,000 base pairs, you will get this out of pattern that I was showing you before. Here is a very short segment of that 7,000 base pairs molecule. And here, you see, we pull at a given speed, which is higher. This is probably done at 200 nanometers per second. So it's 10 times faster than before. And uh, you see that there is the magenta curves that correspond to unfolding, let's say, unzipping. And there is the green curves that correspond to rezipping. And there is some hysteresis. So we repeat this experiment many times. Every curve you see is a cycle. And every cycle occurs, uh, every cycle gives you different um, falling force, let's say. The rip occurs at a different force, and also for the zipping. But you see there is a difference, a systematic difference between the magenta, magenta ribs and green ribs. The magenta are above the green ones. And this is because of the hysteresis. Okay? So if I were to pull this at 20 nanometers per second, then probably I wouldn't see this. Um, this systematic difference, OK? <clears throat> so this is an illustration of an experiment of this type. This is what you see. You pull, you, you unfold, you refold. It's like a switch. It has a two-state conformational transition behavior around always these 15 piconewtons you see here, OK? So you can go on and go on and collect many curves as you want. So you will ask, then, what is this useful for? Well, this is useful because you can measure the work doing this experiment which is the integral of the force versus extension curve. So you can measure the work, and you know that if you measure the work, you can extract the free energy difference. This is a question here. Yeah, well, this is just random fluctuations. So the, the process of unfolding, you have to see like two states that have more or less the same free energy. So at 15 piconewtons, the two states are equally probable. So if you were to observe a molecule in real time at 15 piconewtons, you would see how it unfolds and folds and folds and folds. Now, the fact that when you pull mechanically, you move the optical trap, it unfolds at one force or another is just because it has to jump over a barrier. But this is a thermally activated process. And as you know, thermally activated processes have an exponential distribution of times. So it may happen at a short time, so at low force. It may happen at a later time, higher force. So what you see is a reflect of this exponential distribution of lifetimes of a molecule that can be in two states. Okay? So this random sometimes is higher, sometimes is lower. What people do then is to plot the distribution of unfolding forces in this experiment. So you measure at every cycle, you look at which force there is a rip, and you annotate it. Another uh, cycle, which force there is a rip, and so on. You do that for the unfolding, you do that for the refolding, and you have what is called rupture force distributions. Okay? You can do that with RNA herpins as well. There is no mystery on this. Because RNA is also a polymer. There is just a basic chemical difference with DNA, but the experimental setup and everything goes as well the same. And you can do that also with proteins. Proteins are more interesting because proteins, um, in comparison to DNA or RNA molecules, do not show this strict um, switch between two states behavior. 
A protein is a more complicated structure, has a more complicated structure than a DNA hairpin. A DNA hairpin rebinds re or refolds by complementarity of the two strands. But such complementarity rules do not exist for proteins, okay? So for proteins, what happens is that we know that the unfolding will be very similar. And in fact, you may see it here, that when I pull the molecule, you see this is the pulling the protein, and you see the rib here. So the red is unfolding. Here is the handles over stretching. This is a check that our molecular construct is well done. So the protein is inserted between two handles. So when you pull on the protein, there is this rib. So here you convert the, let's say, native uh, structure of this protein, which is an RNA molecule called Barnase, which is 110 amino acids, you convert it into a polypeptide stretch chain. But now when you relax, which is a blue, everything is reversible, but here you see it doesn't fold until you reach about four piconewtons, and you don't see here clearly, but here the folding is taking place. I may show you an animation because I think it's worth, um, it's worth seeing. Um, So this is what you see. So this is force um, over extension, okay? So this is pulling, and you see there is this rip, okay? Now when you relax the force, that's in green, then what you see is that there is not this refolding, because the protein is more complex object, but it falls, okay? Here, there is a falling here, you cannot see. Now if I pull back again, and the color has not changed, be careful on this, but you see that I follow this other branch, so the molecule has, unfold it, okay? So you can go on and go on and do the experiments, but you can see, you can monitor in real time how the molecule falls into the native structure. So that's some sort of experiments. You can also do experiments on molecular motors and then, for example, track how motor uh, enzymes, like in this case, helicases, and zip a herping. So a herping can be mechanically and zip on pulling, but you can spontaneously do that, or you can use an enzyme to spontaneously do that for you. So there are enzymes that are called helicases that hydrolyze ATP to break molecular bonds, okay, of DNA structures, to convert them into single-stranded DNA. And you can use different sort of assays, okay, and you can measure the extension. Here is not shown because it's cut by the screen, but extension in nanometers, uh, sorry, um, that's extension, uh, no, it must be extension in, in microns as a function of time, okay? And then uh, here as a function of, yeah, as a function of time. So what you see is that basically you have different, these are different experiments uh, of the same motor and zipping the DNA molecule, but then what you see here is that there are different speeds. And this is because uh, it's something we don't understand yet, but it seems that these motors are very heterogeneous. These enzymes have interactions with the substrate, which may change, not because the enzyme is different, the enzyme is the same, but the modes of interaction are, tend to be heterogeneous. And that's a very interesting uh, subject of current research, because it's now to be discovered that or it's going to, it's being discovered right now that many proteins that were thought to have a unique mode of native folding, it's not like that. There is an ensemble of native states, every one of them functionally active, functionally active, but with different degrees. And this here you can see by the different speeds. So of course this motor at 48 base pairs per second, this any case will do as much well as this 100 base pairs per second. Just is that it will be slower, but it will do the, it anyway. So it's something that is now a very active field of research. And actually the core of my talk was about energy, information, and temperature. And what I will do in my remaining time is uh, just show you some of the two applications uh, we have been doing in, um, in measuring uh, these quantities. So usually when I give this talk, I, I, if I don't have much time, I talk about energy and information. But now, today, we'll talk about information and temperature, 
Okay? So these are three quantities in thermodynamics. And maybe information is not so familiar to you in thermodynamics because you know it under the name of entropy. But basically is that these instruments, because they have a very high resolution in force and extension, they can allow you to measure with very high resolution energies. Okay? So we have very accurate measurements of energies of molecular transformations. What is, more, what is not so well known is that these single molecule experiments allow you to, to measure information with very high accuracy. Information in terms of entropy. And that's because you can track with very high precision conformational changes. And therefore, if molecules are jumping between two states and you want to convert this signal of the extension of the molecule, you want to extract information of the signal that records the molecular transformation, okay? You will read the signal, you will say, okay, the molecule has an extension, it's folded, now there is a jump, it's unfolded, now it folds back again. You can track with so much resolution too, and you can see the jump with so high resolution that you can also convert these traces into sequences of ones and zeros, so binary sequences. So you can have information about the binary sequence. So the same technique that allows you to have accuracy in energy allows you to, to track conformation, cha conformational changes in a molecule and therefore convert a time series by monitoring one single molecule into a time series of one and zeros in a binary uh, sequence, okay? So, So about information, I want to show you beautiful experiments we have been doing uh, in collaboration with Marco Ribetzi, who is uh, here in the audience, and also he's uh, here working in Paris in SPCI. And uh, it's something we have not published, we should publish soon, but I think it's a beautiful demonstration of how you can measure this information, such information in these experiments. So let me recall you what, uh, I want to show you how we can do something which is, um, very common in thermodynamics, which is to transform, to transduce one quantity in another. So we know how to transduce work, let's say, into entropy, into heat. You just need to take an object, uh, move it on the, on the floor, and you, by friction, convert work into heat. So this is what I would call work into entropy um, conversion, right? Now we can do the other way around. We can do conversion from entropy, or if you want, from information into work. And what we can do in these experiments is to reach such a conversion and to measure information quantities to a tenth of a bit, okay, of accuracy. Now let me show you what experiment we have, been, we have done with, with Marco. This is a Maxwell Demon realization. This is a, a pictorial a schematics of what is a Maxwell Demon. You know Maxwell Demon uh, was proposed as a way to violate the second law by Maxwell in the late 19th century, where he proposed the following. Suppose that you have uh, a vessel, okay, or um, yeah, you have uh, a vessel with two compartments, two parts, okay, and there is a small gate connecting the two parts. And now, in principle, when the, um, what, what you do is you start uh, from equilibrium, so the gate is open, it's completely open, of course, you have a homogeneous and uniform distribution of velocities of the gas. So if you put a thermometer on the left compartment, you will read a temperature which is equal to the temperature of the, of the right compartment. Now let's assume that this is completely isolated, so there is no heat exchange with the environment. Okay, so this is a microcanonical system somehow if you want. Now what you do is the following, you put a small demon, which is shown in green here, which has a somehow, uh, um, it has a cord that connects to this door, and then he does the following, this demon is so small and is also intelligent, so he's capable of measuring the speeds of the molecules. But what he does is follow when he sees a speed molecule moving to the right, okay, he opens the gate and leaves the speed molecule to go to the right. But if he sees that the molecule approaching the gate from the left side is, 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 has lower speed, then what he does is he closes immediately the gate and then he does not allow for the, uh, for the molecule to go to the right side. He can do the same for the molecules from the right side. He can allow the slow molecules to go to the left, but not to the fast molecules to go to the left. At the end, of course, by doing this operation and opening and closing many times this gate, he will, get, he will, he will be able to get high speed molecules on the right, low speed on the left. And of course, you see, immediately this violates the second law because in this procedure you can demonstrate, and this has been matter of discussion for a century, but now we know this is true, that you can do this operation without 
okay, expanding work. So to open this gate mechanically, you don't need to the work. You can have a frictionless, in principle, gate, and therefore you can get to this without expanding work. And now the problem is that you start with a homogeneous uniform temperature system, and you end up with a system with two compartments, one with low temperature on the left, high temperature on the right. So without doing a mechanical work, you produce a temperature gradient. And that, uh, of course, decreases the entropy and goes, the total entropy of the system, this goes against the second law. That's one visualization of the Maxwell demon. Produce gradients from uniform distributions without performing any work. There is another realization of the same idea, which is called the Zillar motor. The Zillar motor has a difference with respect to the Maxwell demon. The Zillar motor is done in the canonical. So for the Zillar motor, there is a bath surrounding the system. But the idea is basically the same. The idea is the following. You have now a system that can exchange heat with environment. Before, there was no exchange of heat with the Maxwell demon. Now there is. And then you see the molecule. When the molecule is moving inside the vessel, okay, and then he does the following. He first sees the mo the molecule, and then he says, okay, the molecule is on the left. So immediately, the demon puts a wall, okay? And then, not only puts a wall, he also attaches a lever with, um, a, lever with a weight, okay? In such a way that this molecule will, this is a frictionless wall, so then the bouncing molecule, which is captured on the left side, okay, is captured, trapped in this side, will collide with the, uh, with the wall, with this wall, frictionless wall from the left, but there was no collision from the right because there is no molecule there. It's just a single molecule experiment. And therefore, what will happen is that we, it, the, the collisions will make this lever move to the right in such a way that at some point this wall move to the right, such a way that you can convert the average pressure exerted by the molecule into a mechanical work useful to lift a weight. Now you can see that the maximum average extracted work per cycle, okay, is KBT, the average information, which in this case, the information you can get is log of two because there are two units, two vessels, two compartments, and the information is a log of the number of possibilities, which in this case is two, and you can get, you can see that you can per cycle as much as extract KBT log two. So here, I'm sorry, it's not shown, but should be for some reason, uh, well, I cannot see even my slides, so I made something wrong probably. Okay, that's the maximum amount of work you can get for the average work per cycle. Average, because there are fluctuations. Sometimes, if you do this for a single um, molecule, sometimes you will pay a lot of work. You will not get work. You will not be able to extract work. This will go down the weight. Other times, you will be able to extract more. But in average, this is the maximum you will be able to get, okay, in average. And that's one of the important things. When you do things at the single molecule level, then you have this thing. Now you can understand that in the experiments, in the molecular experiments I was showing you, I can implement the same idea because if I have a molecule, a herpin, that can be in two states, I have like a two vessel particle, right? I mean, I have my molecule that can be folded or unfolded. From the practical, from the fundamental point of view, it's the same as before. I see my molecule and if it is on the left, right side of the vessel, then I put the wall and extract work. If it is on the left side of the vessel, I put the wall but extract work from the other side. I can do the same game. But instead of having a particle in two sides of a big vessel, I have a molecule in two states. So I look at the molecule. If it is folded, I do something to extract work of it, from it. If it is unfolded, I do something to extract work from it. I always extract work from it, okay? Whenever I can, because there are fluctuations. So we can experimentally realize this Maxwell demon um, beat, let's say, single molecule experiment, we can uh, realize it by, by, by putting us in a condition where the molecule, the herpin, can hop between two conformations. And now that's not chance, but this force is about 15 piconewtons. That's the typical force where you saw the opening of the herpin. So if I stretch my optical tweezers and I put it at a force where the molecule is tensioned by 15 piconewtons, it will start hopping back and forth with an exponential distribution of lifetimes. And this explains a question by some of you before about why the force of, an, an zippy, of unfolding the force rip occurs after or before. Because there is a stochastic distribution of lifetimes. And therefore, if I move my optical trap, it may happen after or before. Because the, the, time, the lifetimes, the times of, of hopping between the two states of jumping are stochastic, are exponentially distributed, okay?
is like the radioactive decay. It's the same thing as you are seeing here in this beautiful uh, panel here <laughs> with numbers. So these are the two conditions, uh, the two states where we can see our molecules. So I show you here this passive hopping. You put the molecule, for example, at high forces. So there is equilibrium force, a typical force, where the molecule will occupy 50% of each of the two states, which will be the medium forces, which is this coexistent force middle panel here. If you look at the occupancies of the two states, you see two Gaussians with the same, approximately the same weight. Now, if you go to high forces, you see that the molecule populates this uh, lower force state because the molecule tends to be unfolded mostly. If you go to lower forces, average forces, you tend to populate the higher force state. So there is this, let's say, um, regime. Of course, the force is, is jumping because this is the so-called passive hopping. But you see this low force is the average force. This goes from 15.5 to 17. Now it goes up from 16.5 to 17.5 but you still see this hopping, and then to 17 to 18.5. So we can experimentally tune, not only, we can not only do the experiment at medium forces where we populate 50% the probability, we can make a maxwell demon experiment where our particle, for example, has more probability to be found in the left or in the right. Suppose that you do this uh, by, uh, for example, uh, by, for example, moving the, the, the wall to the left or to the right, then you won't have the 50% probability. So somehow we can tune this experimentally. So we can do a more general maxwell demon motor. So this is a maxwell demon. Okay, the molecule is hopping between the two states, and then you do the following. Um, you do a measurement, and then if the force is high, this means the molecule is in the folded state, then you immediately lower the force, and you start recovering the force, okay, up to reaching the original level. So this is like, putting a wall here, you immediately put a wall, like in the Maxwell Demon, put a weight with a lever, no? And then a pulley to extract work from the weight. That's the same experiment we're doing here, okay? And here I show you, and that will be my last slide because I think it's time to, to stop probably here, but uh, that if you do this, okay, uh, you, see here, you see here this experiment repeated many, many hundreds of times to get a distribution of the work we can extract from this demon per cycle. And you see that there are distributions of work. So phi equals zero means basically 50% probability in the hopping signal to be in each of the two states. That's the original Maxwell demon, and in the Zillar motor, that, that was what gave you the average work cannot be bigger than KBT log two, okay? So you see here, the work is extracted when it's negative. Okay? And the work is delivered when it's positive. So for phi equals zero, which is equal probability, you see there is an experimental distribution. The work is not always equal to one value or another. It's distributed, and it goes from minus 1.5 kBT to approximately, in this case, zero kBT. Okay? So sometimes we cannot, we cannot extract anything at all, but there is a distribution. And this is because there are thermal fluctuations. But if you look at the average, which is shown by the mean, or the mean of the distribution, which is shown by this red-blue dot, you see that it, it goes into KBT log two. So KBT log two is approximately, log two is 0 0.69. So in KBT units, this is minus 0 0.69 because we are extracting it and we follow it, okay? And if you look in conditions which is not so favorable, then you see that the average work is a bit lower. But the maximum work we can extract is set by the Landauer limit, which is this vertical dashed line. So this is an experimental demonstration, an experimental realization of a Maxwell demon with one bit, okay, in a single molecule, which is the original Gedanken experiment of Zillard, okay? Not the Maxwell, because Maxwell was for an isolated system. This is is a system in a contact bath, or molecules in water. And they had a part about temperature, but I don't have time for that because I think it's better uh, maybe to stop um, and make uh, people ask questions. I think there was enough information, I hope. <laughs> and uh, well, let me just finish by thanking uh, the people um, who made possible um, this work, and here it's a picture one year ago from my lab, so some people are not there anymore, but most of the work on, on herpins was done by, by Juan Camuñas, maybe not the results I show you, 
but uh, she did uh, beautiful work on fluctuation theorems. And on early cases, most of the work has been done by <coughs> Maria Mañosas. And here I want to underline, uh, to underline also um, Marco Rivetzi, who was doing the experiments on Maxwell Demon, who is sitting here in the audience. And also we have uh, Marta Gironella, who is attending the conference. But I didn't show any results from her, but she's in beautiful noise spectroscopy measurements. And she would be very glad to, to speak to you and show you her poster. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll be glad to ask questions. Thank you.